this review is brought to you by Hard Drives. Hard Drives, back up your data frequently because you never know when your computer will go crazy and decide to delete everything. And this review is also brought to you by YouTube Copyright Bots because the first time I tried uploading this finally finished project, it got blocked worldwide for using the trailer footage. So forgive my lateness and the less visually distracting nature of this review. Anyway, if there was one thing that could have increased my anticipation at the prospect of another Wes Anderson stop motion work after Fantastic Mr. Fox became one of my favorites, it was the prospect of a PG-13 stop motion set in Japan that actually uses Japanese language. That said, naturally not everyone's on board with Wes Anderson's style, and if you thought this would be the time he'd decide to take a break from his monotone deliveries, his symmetrical frames, his characters talking directly into or perpendicular to the camera, his overhead prop shots, chapter titles, and everything else on his trailers listed, I think the trailer pretty much solved that mystery. And even for stop motion, Anderson doesn't exactly aim for the fluidity of, say, Laika. His films tend to have a low frame rate, it's a little bit jerky, when the characters move quickly it suddenly feels like the film's on fast forward. Like everything he does, it feels just a bit off. It does make sense, as he himself cites one of his influences as being the Rankin-Bass Christmas specials, that while nostalgic and charming, no one can accuse of being smooth or lifelike. But like all his films, you cannot deny his level of detail. I love that he uses fur and clothes for a variety of textures, the characters are well designed, and in general, I like his style, partly just because he has one. And does he know how to make his films look better? beautiful. Half of this film takes place in a dump and it still looks gorgeous. The color usage, the shot framing, the Japanese style paintings and artwork. Oh, it's so pretty. Added with the soundtrack that includes Anderson's usual collection of 60s and 70s folk, as well as adding some themes from classic Japanese films, the overall tone is haunting and borders right on the edge of somber, however, never tips over into depressing and still gives the sense of childhood adventure. And this film film wins the cell specs bonus point for utilizing a 2D animated element in a 3D medium by recreating all the characters in two dimensions when they appear on computer screens. Now story-wise, nearly everything involving the dog characters is fantastic. The voices are great, they look like dogs that have been living in the dump, the characters have amusing backstories, the four apart from Chief are in many ways treated as a unit but they do have their own distinct personalities. Even without knowing exactly what he's saying, Atari gives off such a determined and enduring but still playfully boyish personality, but the big players here are Chief and Spots, which isn't a spoiler, there are flashbacks. While Chief is set up to be the standard tough stoic who doesn't like or care about anything, that will eventually have his heart melted by this child, which is basically what happens, but the way the story unfolds, his narrative goes a bit differently than you'd think it would, which is pretty much how you can describe the film as a whole. Also, funny how it always seems like Chief is the leader in this pack, except it's not. It's really Edward Norton. The film isn't constantly laugh out loud funny, but overall the dialogue is very witty and entertaining. An acknowledgement considering the film's subject can get very bleak. Yeah, the PG-13 is no half-assed sensitive parent precaution. There are some dark elements in this. I mean, the intro to our main characters includes one biting another dog's ear off and the group seriously contemplating suicide. Further illustrated that there are quite a few scenes of characters crying right into the camera. And while it's limited in on-screen violence, it's definitely got some graphic imagery, including the condensed but kind of real-time dissection of a fish and crab to make sushi and a kidney transplant. Now, were these scenes absolutely necessary? I would say that they add to the film's atmosphere and grim reality, but I'd also argue that animation, especially stop motion, is one medium where supposedly needless impressive visuals are usually warranted just for the craft as long as they're done really well. However, the question of was that absolutely necessary is a common question that pops up in the plot. There's a twist with Chief's character that seems sort of superfluous. There's a moment where a character or characters seem to suddenly die only to not have, but then they don't do anything for the rest of the film, so were they originally supposed to die, but that would have been too dark, but then if that wasn't the plan, then why was the scene there? And then there are just a lot of 
detail thrown into this film's story that does make the world feel richer, but it also can make it feel a bit overwhelming. However, more often than not, I'd say that these moments are head scratching, but not deal breakers, because they're overall still pretty fun to watch. However, as the film goes on, it does seem like it keeps cutting away from the dog's story more and more, and the scenes without them are much less engaging. Now, before I go further into why, let's just acknowledge the elephant in the criticism of cultural appropriation. The details of which I'm not gonna go full into. If you're interested, read the articles, or here's a brief summary of the most common points. But I do want to emphasize this. When these sorts of topics come up in its ideal form, it is not about suggesting that the film should be banned or boycotted. It's not to just say bad things about the director or to make people feel bad about liking it. It's just about having the discussion. Because the more we talk about the unconscious implications of the media we consume, the less power they have over us. In its ideal form, however, there's also been a lot of defense for the film, from the voice who does the mayor, to other native Japanese speakers. Now, if my take counts for anything, which it may not, the points brought up are not invisible, and I get the frustration, but I also stand by what I said earlier. Nothing in this film is as bad as a certain other scene from a certain other movie that came out recently. Speaking of which, it does make me feel better that even though Sherlock Gnomes has still technically made more money, I Love Dogs broke the top 10 when it was only in 500 theaters. Yeah, I know it was early April, but still, that is amazing. But back to the point. I did wonder if the reason the human sections weren't as gripping was because of the decision to have them only speak in non-subtitled Japanese. Not just because those scenes could annoy people who didn't understand it or weren't me, but if those scenes were approached with the mentality of, oh, the audience isn't going to understand what they're saying anyway, so we won't even try to flesh out these characters. I do think that was a factor, but it didn't have to be. Atari and even the scientists are really likable characters that you can tell do what they do because they really care about the dogs. Whereas the mayor is really just a functional antagonist because his scenes are mostly just exposition. Still, while it's a cute idea because there's a language barrier between dogs and humans because it's like real life. Aside that this gimmick evaporates the minute you dub this entire film for a Japanese audience, was it necessary to give the human characters blocks of untranslated dialogue as opposed to one line and conveying everything else visually? I guess because Anderson has always relied very heavily on his dialogue, I guess he couldn't change it even for this. Admittedly, more could have been done for these characters, but then the film isn't really about them, it's about the dogs. And I wish they were in the film even more than they are, especially in the third act, but no, we needed to make room for Greta Gerwig's Tracy Walker, easily the worst byproduct of the language barrier. Because despite that there were Japanese translator characters and nearly every Japanese speaking human at the end of a monologue eventually stooped to summing it up in broken English anyway, but all of a sudden it didn't make sense to have an English speaking human if they weren't half American. But you know what my biggest problem with her was? She is useless. I get the purpose of focusing on her was just to show that there was a group of pro-dog lovers opposing the mayor, but we just pointed out you didn't need a human to speak English to show that. But the only thing she really does is take the fully completed cure from the alive female scientist to another location. Hey, here's a question. Why couldn't the female scientist have done that? Oh, because she's traumatized by the assassination of another scientist, so they needed to get a schoolgirl with a blonde afro to do it. Oh, and fun piece of irony, she tanks the entire pro-dog movement because she sucks at giving speeches. Gee, maybe we should have picked someone to speak Japanese to the Japanese crowd. Maybe then it actually would have worked. But as we said before, you can have virtually pointless elements as long as they're still entertaining. But she is not. She's actually quite annoying. It's just really hard to root for a character that utters the words, I need to prove my conspiracy theory. Well, at least it puts her above real conspiracy theorists in that she actually tries to find proof. But what are the odds that the mayor is such a one-dimensional evil person that he orders the manufacturing of the disease as an excuse to deport the dogs in the first place? Oh wait, that's what actually happens. So again, we're in Zootopia territory where the source of discrimination isn't complicated history 
or flaws of humanity as a whole, but consciously orchestrated by politicians. But I know we can't address all the intricacies in an hour and a half film. However, then imagine this entire film being soaked in this dread and oppression, establishing this guy as the pro-puppy genocide garbage human that he is, and then having a climax that almost completely invalidates all of it. Boy, that... That would sure be disappointing. Because yes, the final climax and resolution for many reasons that I will not spend another hour talking about, so here's another spoiler text wall, is easily the weakest part of the film. However, despite all of the issues I have mulled over, some of which were just things that I got on a think tangent about, this is a good, even great film, but I can understand that it might not be for everyone. I think the story could have been hammered out a little better, but overall it works, and even as flawed as the ending is, it's not so terrible that it derails the entire thing. But the beautifully composed shots and backgrounds, the dog characters, the dialogue, the melancholic but hopeful tone, and the soundtrack is what makes this film. Isle of Dogs is a stirring, beautiful experience that I want as many people to see in theaters, so maybe we can get more PG-13 animations made. It's hard to say if this is better than Fantastic Fox, it's certainly not as tightly structured. It is more ambitious and possibly better looking, but Fox is a a bit more satisfying. So as some people will know, I'm a big fan of Rooster Teeth. I've loved Red vs. Blue for over a decade. I love Ruby. I've loved Ruby Chibi, possibly even more than regular Ruby, because at least there the characters were on opposite side of the world from each other for two seasons. Well, their latest animated project is a few weeks underway called Nomad of Nowhere. And yes, it's funny with interesting characters in a Western-style fantasy world that reminds me of Trigun, which is only a good thing, but mostly because of... Uncle Nomad! Seriously, this character is amazing, and I love him, and I really want someone to do a fan art of me, him, and the Beast from Garden Wall. I know ideally the point of recommendations is to point out things that are a little bit more obscure, not series whose episodes were trending for several days, but sometimes you just want to talk about what you want to talk about. Also, Red vs. Blue Season 16 is also underway. Comment, like, subscribe, etc., and you stay shiny, Animaniacs! Oh, and also the analyst videos are gonna get moved to a new channel. Okay, bye!